Brian and Kenzie Show. On Q101. Brian and Kenzie on Q101. Time for Kenzie's Crimes, where she brings something you may have heard something about it because it's a local crime in the Chicago or Illinois area. Which we, could be so many things. Oh, pff, so many. A do, plethora of choices. Yeah, we do a deep dive into it. Maybe you've never heard anything about it, or maybe you just, you know, like I said, know a little bit, but when we go in this dive, you're going to definitely learn something today. So me and Case know nothing about what she's going to talk about, so we're all in this together, just listening to Kenzie bring this to the table. Okay, I feel like this is... I always say it's rough to say, like, oh, it's a good one, because it sounds bad. None yeah. of it's good. Nah, most but, crimes aren't that great. But it's, I would say it's an interesting. Let's okay. go. That's that's a better word. So Good deal. Um, you know, a runny nose and a sore throat are often not a huge cause for concern, right? Mm-hmm. I think we, those are symptoms we all experience and are usually very easily treatable. So Mary Kellerman was a 12-year-old girl from Elk Grove Village, Illinois. And she certainly wasn't worried when she woke up with those symptoms September 29th, 1982. She told her parents how she felt. She received a single extra strength Tylenol in return and was dead by 7 a.m. What? Holy cow. That fast. I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't either. I told you I was coming at you like a Mack truck today. Damn. <laughs> so okay. the same day, Terrible. a 27-year-old postal worker named Adam Janice of Arlington Heights, Illinois, died of what was thought to be a massive heart attack. His brother and sister-in-law, Stanley, who was 25, and Teresa, who was 19, both lived in Lyle, Illinois, and rushed to his home to console their loved ones. They were both experiencing throbbing headaches, which is a super common response when you have trauma, you know, death in a family, things like that. They each took a extra sink Tylenol capsule from the same bottle Adam had used earlier that day. Stanley died that very day. Teresa died two days later. God! Over the next few days, three more strange deaths occurred. 35-year-old Mary McFarland of Elmhurst, Illinois. 35-year-old Paula Prince of Chicago. And 27-year-old Mary Weiner or Wiener, we don't know, of Winnefield, (laughs) Illinois. All of them, it turned out, had taken Tylenol shortly before they died. So this obviously happened, um, as I said, this all kicked off uh, September 29th. Early October, so not too long later, obviously, um, of 1982 is when investigators made the connection between the poisoning deaths and Tylenol, which at the time was the best-selling non-prescription pain reliever in the United States. And I can say it probably still, I don't know about that. I still take Tylenol. That's all I take. That's what you be popping? Yeah. For them knees? For all the stuff. I know your knees as well. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Was knees if I, if I need anything, I need anything, it's Tylenol. So I, I take it all the time. I get it. Now, the gelatin-based capsules were the most popular at the time because they were slick and easy to swallow. No commentary, Brian. I will just sit over here and listen. Yes, I'm not saying anything about it. Um, Unfortunately, each victim swallowed a Tylenol capsule laced with a lethal dose of cyanide. Mm. Now, uh, people were in a panic. You got to think about this. These murders are random. They're senseless attacks. And you don't know what's happening. Is this a mistake that was made at a factory with Tylenol? Are other products affected? The people were scared to use any of their medications, right? What else is laced? Sure. Is this the company as a whole? They were on the edge of their seats to find out what was happening in Illinois, what was happening with their medications. Now, McNeil Consumer Products is a subsidiary of the healthcare giant Johnson & Johnson. So that one we're all familiar with, right? Sure. That is who manufactured Tylenol. Now, to their credit... The company took a huge active role with media. They issued a mass warning, immediately recalled over 31 million bottles of Tylenol that were in circulation. Tainted capsules were discovered at the same time, early October, in several other grocery stores and drugstores in the Chicago area. Luckily, they were recalled before consumed. So there would have been how many more deaths Mm. if these bottles had gone out. So honestly, super thankful that they reacted the way they did so quickly and got them off the shelves. Uh, Johnson & Johnson offered replacement capsules to anybody who had already purchased pills and turned them back in. And they also were offering a award for anyone with information leading to the apprehension of the individual or people involved with these random murders. So Johnson & Johnson was coming out the gate, quickly establishing that the cyanide lacing occurred after the cases of Tylenol left the factory. Yep. So the police hypothesized that someone must have taken bottles off of the shelves of local grocers and drugstores in the Chicago area 
laced the capsules with poison and returned them to the restored shelves and been purchased by unknowing victims. This is this is unbelievable because I re- I remember this. Do you? A hundred percent. This uh, you know I'm old enough to remember this as a kid, and this was one of the most terrifying things that ever hit not only Chicago but the country. At yeah. this point, this was this is the unbelievable. products that you're buying. This isn't okay. I'm not going to walk in a dark alley. I'm not yeah. going to go anywhere by myself. It's what products. Are, is this going to end up my food? Is it going to end up in my drink? What yeah. about my prescriptions? Like, how terrifying every time you take a sip, a bite, or your medication, are you wondering if something's going to happen to you, your family, your children? Yeah. Now, this usually doesn't happen. Not long after the murders, Johnson & Johnson received a letter from the alleged killer threatening, saying, if you don't give me $1 million, the killing will not stop. Yeah. I'm going to pause believable. right there. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to pause because not, you're not going to believe what happens to the person who sent the letter and what he was saying he was trying to do. Wow. Well, when we come back, we'll give you the full continuation of the Chicago Tylenol murders, which if you don't remember or maybe you're just hearing this the first time, it's it's wild and insane. Uh, coming back here with Brian and Kenzie on Q101 in just a couple minutes. The Brian and Kenzie Show. On Q101. Brian and Kenzie on Q101, Kenzie's Crimes, and we're back with the Chicago Tylenol murders. Uh, something so fascinating. Again, I know a lot of people have heard about this a little bit, but going deeper dive and learning something about it that you probably don't know about from Kenzie as you continue right here. I know. So if you're just joining us, uh, we're we're going over the Tylenol murders, which are very infamous, that happened in the Chicagoland area. Seven uh, random, unrelated people were the victim of this crime when they found out that Tylenol bottles had randomly been laced with cyanide and re-put on the shelves for purchase, okay? So uh, Johnson & Johnson is the company that owned Tylenol at the time. They recalled over 31 million bottles of Tylenol and wanted people to know this happened outside of the factory because people weren't sure if something had happened as a mistake within, you know, the company and the packaging. So they were like, no, this is like, this was like methodical. This is a true murder. And after the recall, after offering a reward for anybody who had information, Johnson & Johnson actually received a letter from the alleged killer saying, I want a million dollars or the killing is not going to stop. Wow. See, I don't remember that part of the story, so I'm curious to see what happened here. So it didn't take long for them to actually locate who wrote the letter. James Lewis was convicted a year after sending the letter for attempted extortion. Now, they never charged him with the murders because they couldn't place him in Chicago. He was living in New York at the time, and there were no fingerprints that matched. Now, this is a tough time because this is before, like, you got heavily ID'd, getting on a plane, all those things. So it was hard to place somebody depending on how they traveled. There wasn't road cameras. If he drove here, things like that, that we would have all that information. So after he got convicted for the extortion, but before he was sentenced, he calls the FBI and says, I'd like to help you solve the case. I think I can help. I think I can help you find the quote unquote real killer. He then sat down for a series of interviews, waived his right for a lawyer being present and began to tell them what he thinks the killer is thinking when he was poisoning the capsules and put them back on the shelf. He also ends up drawing very vivid pictures and diagrams of how to drill the pill with like a small hole place the cyanide in with not accidentally poisoning yourself in the process. It's very O.J. Simpson of if I had done it. (laughs) I see where O.J. took his inspiration now. Uh. It's wild. So Uh. in a 1992 interview 10 years later uh, with the Associated Press, Lewis explained that the account he was giving to the authorities, he was just trying to explain the killer's actions. He said, quote, I was doing like I would if I had done a corporate client presentation, (laughs) making a list of possible scenarios, said Lewis, and then he called the killer a heinous, cold-blooded killer and a cruel monster. That apparently he knew exactly what he was thinking, so it's very interesting. Uh, Lewis later admitted to sending the letter and demanding the money, even though he still said he had nothing to do with the murders. Right. He said he intended to collect the money not for himself, but to embarrass his wife's former employer by having the money sent to the employer's bank account. 
Oh, well, he's a good guy, then. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to frame somebody else. Yeah. But he has nothing to do with what's going on. Yeah, he's, uh, I'm sure he's fine, upstanding citizen, coaching maybe Little League on the weekend. Sounds right. like a good guy. Doing charity. Well, I will tell you other things Lewis was up to, because this was not his first run-in with criminal behavior. In 1978, he was charged in Kansas City, Missouri, with the dismemberment murder of Raymond West, 72, uh, who had hired... Uh, James Lewis as an accountant uh, and the charges were dismissed because uh, West's cause of death was not fully determined and uh, some of the evidence had been illegally obtained he was also convicted of six counts of mail fraud in 1981 uh, in a huge credit card scheme in Kansas City accused of using the name and background of a former tax client to obtain 13 credit cards he was also charged in 2004 with kidnapping and other offenses for an alleged attack on a woman in Cambridge. Uh, he was jailed for three years waiting his trial, but prosecutors had to dismiss the case because the victim refused to testify oh. once it came around. He got truly blessed. He gets off a lot on <laughs> these cases. is this insane? <laughs> uh, the things he has done, it's unbelievable. So in 1983... Uh, during this, because obviously the crimes happened in 1982. So during police's encounter with him in 1983, they were describing Lewis as a chameleon who lived in several states and used at least 20 aliases and held many jobs, including computer specialist, tax accountant, importer of Indian tapestry, tapestries. Oh, well, that's a guy I want to talk to. <laughs> salesman of jewelry, pharmaceutical machinery, and real estate. Oh, okay. So he's a man like... of many hats. Showing you your houses on the weekend, too. Yeah, okay, yeah, sue a guy for having hobbies, I guess. Yeah. You know, with a side of light crime, if you will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you include murder and kidnapping as light crime. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> despite his previous trouble with the law, uh, Lewis always denied any role in the Tylenol deaths, but remained a suspect and in 2010 had to give even more DNA samples to the FBI. That uh, much he, later now? It's 2010? Gave so, he's, so he's not in jail at all. He just got, he just, he, they couldn't uh, he, figure it out. He served in jail for the extortion, the extortion. but was able to get out after several okay. years because okay. extortion, unfortunately, isn't a lifelong sentence in this case. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he gave even more samples to the DNA. Uh, the, the FBI was actually getting ready to reopen the case because of the advancement in technology. Uh, one of the really incriminating things was the postmark on the letter that he sent to Johnson & Johnson for extortion was dated prior to it being public knowledge that people were dying because of Tylenol. Hmm. So, so he jumped the gun on his own... Jumped the gun a bit. I mean, <laughs> some may call it being organized. Mm. Uh, you know, he's just like, let me get this off my checklist because yeah, yeah, yeah. I may forget yeah. later. I'm going to be slammed oh, once sorry, it hits I'm, the sorry news. productive. Uh. So clearly, uh, a lot of people, I mean, many believe to this day that James Lewis is the culprit behind the Tylenol murders. The case was actually getting ready to be reopened. However, if this is true... Justice will cease to be served because he died of natural causes at age 76, July 9th, 2023. Oh, just last year? Yes. Oh. They're going to reopen the case. They have this whole thing against him dies of natural causes. Uh, somebody said it was a shame that he died, not because he died, but because it was because of natural causes and instead of behind bars. Damn right. He made a lot of enemies. Now, Obviously not the conclusion we'd all want, but the only positive of the story and something that people may not realize is this is the exact crime and exact case that is the reason pills, medication, and all other products have protective seals. And if broken prior to purchase, we all know they should not be used or consumed. And this law has probably saved countless innocent lives now that it's existed. So every little seal that you see on all, you're talking anywhere from milk to other, you know, food products, chip bags, whatever, the seals are uh, all because of this. Because of this... one one guy, it takes me that much extra time to get them my chips ahoy. Yeah. That's not fair. That's not fair. And that, that's Brian's takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that insane, though? That's nuts. I will say this. If you take um, one of the gangster tours here in Chicago that takes off from the Hancock building, when I had family in town, Megan's uh, family, you know, they give a tour of, of course, Al Capone and, the, you know, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And they go by the Walgreens over at North and Wells. That's one of the stores where one of them was sold. And they actually stop the bus there and talk about it for a second. And they talk about wow. it. They say in their tour that it's never been solved. As you said, it kind of was, but then we don't know. Yeah. So it's kind of wild. I, uh, it, it is wild. What's even more wild is he had a wife when he died. And I'm like, why would you marry him? 
<laughs> like, listen, I don't have a great red flag bar, yeah. but damn. You know what I mean? The Brian and Kenzie Show. On Q 101.